So today we're hanging the tablet ornament, and the title of the story is Let My People Go. So what went wrong in Egypt? It was a small voice, but it filled the big church. The boy came and stood at his elbow. I'm hungry. The ice cream truck didn't come today. Is that a whip you're carving? Did one of Jesus' ancestors drive a stagecoach? I'm carving a whip to symbolize the time when the Hebrews, the Israelites that is, were slaves. As the years passed, Joseph and the famine were forgotten. A new Pharaoh was in power. Then the Egyptians suddenly looked around at the huge number of Hebrew, Hebrews living in Egypt and became afraid. They made the he Hebrew settlers their slaves and worked them like pack animals or farm beasts. But God had a rescue plan, I bet. Naturally. Jesus? No, 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 little boy. This was long, long before Jesus. This time, God saw that his chosen people were in trouble, and he sent Moses. Did he help them escape? Tell me. Moses could not believe his eyes. A bush was burning, and yet it was not. It looked like extra leaves grew on the twigs. Yellow and red flames covered the bush, but did not destroy it. Then, strangest of all, a voice spoke out of the bush. Take off your shoes, Moses. You are standing on holy ground. Moses shuffled out of his sandals, never once taking his eyes off the burning bush. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have heard the voice of the children of Israel crying out to me for help. So go to Egypt, Moses, and tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. These were not words Moses wanted to hear. Oh, he was an Israelite himself, and he knew very well that they were suffering. He had grown up in Egypt, not as a slave, but in the Pharaoh's own palace, adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. Just once he had stood up for his fellow countrymen. He had killed an overseer who was beating a Hebrew slave to death with a whip. For that, Moses, Moses had had to flee from Egypt as a hunted criminal. I can't. I'm sorry. You're asking the wrong. You shall. I have chosen you to speak for them and to fetch my people out of slavery. Find your brother Aaron and take him with you if you feel the need of his eloquence. I shall be with you both. Go. So Moses gave up his safe little life tending sheep and went back to Egypt where his fellow Israelites toiled all day under Egyptian whips. The God of Israel says, let my people go, said Moses nervously. Pharaoh laughed and to punish his insolence gave orders that the slaves in the brick fields should make bricks without straw they needed for the task. Let my people go, said Moses, while Aaron worked small wonders, turning a stick into a snake. A magic trick, Pharaoh scoffed. Let my people go, or the God I serve will do terrible things to make you change your mind. But Pharaoh only curled his lip in contempt. Then plagues, like the strands of a slave's master's whip, fell across Egypt. The Nile turned to blood. Frogs by the millions made fat red blots as they hopped ashore out of the Crimson River or rained down out of the sky. Let my people go, said Moses, but Pharaoh would not. The frogs died in the street, and black flies rose off in swarms. A plague of flies, God sent diseases that shrank all the fat, sleek cows, horses, and camels into bony bags of hide. He plagued smooth Egyptian bodies with lice and boils and rashes. The crops died in the field. Let my people go, said Moses, but Pharaoh would not. So God browbeat Egypt with fiery hail and freak storms and sent locusts to eat up all the crops. Now will you let my people go, said Moses? But Pharaoh said no. The last plague was the worst of all. God sent the angel of death. Dark as a storm, sharp as the hail, sickening as frogs or boils, winged like locusts, fearsome as the red blood river. Each Israelite smeared its doorpost with lamb's blood, and at the sight of that, the angel turned away. But under every Egyptian door, shut or locked, or open, or barred, the angel slipped in like an icy draft and smothered the firstborn of the household. Let my people go, said Moses. He had to raise his voice above the noise of the weeping mothers, grief-stricken children. Go, get out, be gone, said Pharaoh. Out of Egypt streamed the Israelites, like rivulets, joining into brooks, the brooks into a single river. A host of excited, happy faces hurried past the weeping Egyptian mourners, the newly dug graves. There were donkeys and carts, children and old people, women singing and men asking questions. Where are we going? Where are you taking us, Moses? To a land flowing with milk and honey, he replied. Then one God promised, the one God promised to Abraham. He had no more idea of the way than they had, but he had faith. Suddenly, away in the distance, a swirling spiral of darkness sprang up from the desert sands a pillar of cloud. That way, said Moses, who knew a sign when he saw one. The pillar of cloud led the way by day, 
a pillar of fire after dark. Left behind in his empty streets, Pharaoh looked out at his unfinished monuments, his empty brick fields, and seethed. Why did I give in to that insolent Hebrew? Why did I let him go? Fetch them back, he told his army. Fetch them all back. At the shores of the Red Sea, the war chariots caught up with the runaways. The whirling pillar of cloud placed itself between them, like a mother shielding her child. But the children of Israel had their backs to the sea and nowhere to run. Now Moses stretched out his shepherd's staff, the one that had turned the Nile to blood, and he struck the shallow surf. Slowly sucking and shifting, the waves rised. Like two sleeping people rolling away from one another, the two sides of the sea rolled apart, leaving a path of glistening wet sand, rocks, starfish, and weed. The fleeing Israelites started along this corridor through the ocean glass walled with water 50 fathoms high. They carried their children, their lambs, their bundles, held their breath between their teeth. The watching Egyptians gaped and gasped at the sight of the sea splitting in two. Chariot horses trembled in their traces. Then the pillar of cloud vanished. After them, men. Soft sand sucked at the chariot wheels, but in the Egyptians plunged into the heart of the hallowed sea. They're coming after us, cried the Israelites, looking back over their shoulders, breaking into a run. They ran and they stumbled and they clambered out into the sunlit stones of the far shore. Then the walls of the water crumbled and the waves remembered to break. Like curtains being drawn closed, the two sides of the ocean rejoined. The seething foam tumbled with Egyptian wheels, helmets, reins, curses, whips, swords, and prayers. On the far end of the sea, the children of Israel lay panting on the shore. Behind them, the smooth and silent sea sighed. Ahead of them stretched the empty desert, humming with heat. After generations of slavery, they were finally free. Free to do what? To go thirsty? To starve? After the happiness, panic quickly set in. The flat, hard bread they had hurriedly baked for the journey was gone now. How far must they travel to reach the land of milk and honey? Trust God, Moses had said, but for how long? Next morning they woke, and the ground was caked with cobwebs. Or was it thistledown or moss? Hungry little ones plucked at it and put it in their mouths. Mothers snatched it from them, sniffed the strange stuff, touched it to their tongues. It was food. Eat, said Moses. It is manna. God has sent it. He has spread the desert like a table for you. The manna would not keep. It was no good stuffing it in saddlebags or baskets to eat the next day. By noon it had withered and shriveled away. But each morning there was more, and so the children of Israel gradually learned to trust God's promise day by day to feed them, to guide them, and to take care of them. I found a sandwich, exclaimed the boy, looking over into the pew behind him. Someone's left a half sandwich. He reached over for it. You can't eat that. Why? Oh, is it yours? Sorry. No, it's mine. But you don't know who left it there and how old it is. He watched with disgust as the boy bit into the sandwich, but he felt compelled to ask, what is it? The boy shrugged and chewed, man a sandwich, maybe. Mm -hmm.